Okay, it's half past the hour. And uh, so we're going to start our Managing eLearning Thought Leaders series webinar. So first, a word from our sponsor. Uh, we're sponsored by .org Community, which connects association executives and industry partners through online discussion forums, programs, and webinars. We encourage you to subscribe to .org Community for even more online and live education programming and to fulfill all your annual CAE requirements in one place. So thank you to .org Community. Also a word about our upcoming events. So in March in this webinar series, we will be uh, presenting with um, Association Technologies Inc. on uh, bridging the gap between your AMS and your LMS. So it's always the fourth Tuesday in the month when we present um, at the same time. Uh, we'll also be at the ASI Innovation 2019 conference. If you're attending that, stop by and say hi in sunny Orlando. And uh, we'll be at PersonaFest 2019 in Savannah, Georgia in April. Okay, now for the topic of our webinar. So we're very lucky to have Don Worsley of Element 11 here with us today, and I'll be introducing him in a couple of slides. Uh, we'll be talking about visualizing member ROI with data analytics. And we've got a couple of nice success stories from associations on that topic. So after introductions, we'll be talking about data analytics in general, its connection to big data. So we'll be asking what is big data, what are its uses, why use data visualizations from an association perspective. And then we'll talk, our two success stories are from 4As, that's the American Association of Advertising Agencies, and CHEST, which is the American College of Chest Physicians. They're both making really cool use of data visualization. And finally, we'll talk about how you can get this done, a uh, one, two, three process to, to get up and running. So our guest speaker today is Don Worsley, who's a partner at Element 11, which is a digital agency based out of, the, out of the Midwest that helps associations succeed at achieving their mission. Don has 20 years of experience working with associations, and he loves surrounding himself with smart, passionate people who are driven to innovate. Don finds his sweet spot in helping associations develop solutions and divine strat define strategies that create value for their members. Are you there, Don? I am. Thanks, Andy. And hi, everyone. No problem. <laughs> hey, Don. Um, and uh, I'm Andy Hicken. I'm the Director of Quality and Strategy at WebCourseWorks. A little personal news, I just uh, joined the ASAE Professional Development Council. So I'll be at ASAE Great Ideas um, if you are attending that in March as well. Okay, so we want to start off um, the introduction by talking about big data. So it's certainly a buzzword that you've heard a lot over the last, oh, I mean, it's been probably eight years that people have been talking about, about big data. So it's made it into the Oxford English Dictionary, defined as data of a very large size, typically to the extent that its manipulation and management present significant logistical challenges. Um, the business-oriented definition from Forbes, a new attitude by businesses, nonprofits, government, and individuals that combining data from multiple sources could lead to better decisions. I mean, I know in the world of data science, we often talk about the three Vs of big data, and that's recently been expanded to the five Vs of big data. So we talk about velocity, volume, value, variety, and veracity. So velocity, just the speed that this data accumulates or streams from place to place. The volume, just the sheer amount of data, its value. So we, uh, big data is the basis of what a lot of um, highly profitable corporations are using to make those big profits. The variety, so the data comes from a huge variety of sources, anything from your internet of things device to your, uh, your mobile device to more traditional sources like, um, social media at this point, uh, and then veracity. So is the data trustworthy? Can you trust what it's telling you? Um, or uh, is it actually 
clean, something Don will be talking about a bit. So Don, from your perspective, do associations have big data and where do they find their big data? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's kind of interesting um, because initially uh, the definition of big data was just the three Vs and of course they've added these two Vs. Um, and the definition is, has kind of changed over time. So um, what is kind of a new working definition is, is closer to the one that's on the bottom of the screen. And from an association's perspective, uh, this idea of combining data from multiple data sources is critical. Um, and I think when, when I'm thinking about big data, one of the things that I think about that happened in our space about five years ago was this move towards uh, best of breed. So, you know, five yeah. years ago, the AMS was just the, you know, the center of our universes and everything, you know, was in the AMS, AMS vendors were really trying to do everything. Uh, and so as associations have moved away from that and um, moved, for example, like the education space is a great example with learning management systems. The AMS just can't provide all of the functionality that you would have in a learning management system. And so when you move away from that model into a best of breed model, now it's important to pull that data back together so that you can make important decisions. And the decision making part is the critical part too for associations because you really want to have uh, that data. You want to have a culture in your organization uh, where decisions are made based on data. That's a really good point. And we will be talking about um, the three uses of, uh, of big data models. And actually here, here we are. So um, descriptive models are models that tell you what has happened so it's just getting to the point where you can understand your data um, you can collect it all in, in one place and use it to describe what has happened in reality in your in your recent past so this would be able like in the example you see on the right this would be able to a simple example would be being able to say that your revenue increased by twelve thousand dollars for example then predictive models are the next step up in terms of difficulty and this is the ability to make projections that you can trust about what's going to happen in the future so maybe you can plot your revenue over time for example and then project a trend line into the future so predictive is predicting what's going to happen and then prescriptive models are models that try to tell you what the best decision to make is um, try to tell you what to do so this would be a model that would say, hey, if you really want to maximize your revenue, um, you should take this step as opposed to a, a different step. Or another example of a prescriptive model that's driven by big data that many of us are familiar with are those um, Netflix recommendations for what you should watch next. Uh, Netflix has put a lot into tracking uh, what kind of data its viewers are accumulating it on its platform and using that to to suggest movies that or TV shows that uh, their viewers might like based on sophisticated models around uh, people like this tend to like people who watch these things tend to like also to watch these other things. So that's a prescriptive model. It tells you what to do, <clears throat> which gets to that decision making point uh, that you were talking about, Don. Yeah, and I, for associations, I uh, the way I think of this, like descriptive models, I kind of just think in terms of this is you know the reporting functionality that you have in your AMS, and and maybe your um, a lot of the AMSs have uh, some type of an engagement score, uh, which is a descriptive model. It's just a single value, um, and maybe you have multiple KPI um, uh, KPIs that you've created. But these are descriptive. Where it gets really um, useful and fascinating, I think, is in the predictive and the prescriptive. Um, and I love uh, with predictive, you know, you're, you're telling the future, you're, you're finding correlation in the data. And correlation really leads into prescriptive. That's where you can kind of alter the future. And, and that's what's really fascinating about being able to determine, based on all this data you have, you know, if, a, if my member is performing these particular tasks or involved in these engagement activities, then they're more likely to attend this event or sign up for this webinar um, or participate yeah. in this training. And so that's that's where I think there's a, a an amazing amount of potential. Yeah, or a prescriptive model we see in our, our learning management system business 
we see an interest in is uh, people, associations being able to say, based on what we know about you, your events, your um, kind of profile, what what uh, say your your specialties are within your profession, we would recommend that you look at um, you register for these continuing education event, events. So that'd be an example of like sort of a Netflix style prescriptive model that associations would are, are trying to be able to offer. All right, and we're going to talk a lot about data visualizations today. So data visualizations are often kind of the end product of a big data strategy. Um, so uh, a couple examples that you might be familiar with are um, sort of car sites like True Car or the Kelly Blue Book site um, offers a lot of uh, data visualizations. For example, to be able to plot um, like the projected value of a used car over time as it ages and it gains miles, um, they would give you a data visualization for that. Or mint.com is a personal spending site that um, you can hook up all your bank accounts and credit card accounts to, and then it will offer you really nice visualizations of your spending trends, um, your, uh, your uh, personal financial, what am I trying to say, personal wealth <laughs> over, over time, that, that kind of thing. And I guess the key point here is that these products are really offering data visualization as their core value proposition. Their core product that they offer you is really the visualization of the data. Like Mint doesn't have any information that I can't get on my bank website and you know, on a variety of other websites. It's what it offers me. The reason I use it is because it pulls in all the data in one place and then crunches it for me and shows me these these nice visualizations. So the key takeaway from associations is that um, data visualization can be can be a product. And I think that's what in our two success stories we'll see two examples of associations that are working toward offering data visualization as a product to their members or to other constituents. And I'd like to so with that um, we're going to ask a quick uh, poll question. I, I mentioned we're going to be talking a lot about data visualization. We just want to take your temperature and see where you're at uh, at your organization in terms of data visualization. So what are you using, um, if anything, for data visualization? Uh, go ahead, I'll go ahead and, and start it. Um, we could only put in five options. So. Uh, if you're using something other that's not shown here, feel free to type that in the questions panel and then we'll see it. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll now. So <clears throat> Andy, while we're waiting on that, um, yeah. I've, I was thinking uh, maybe we should add a sixth B to big data and that would be visualization. Um, because it seems like that, yeah. is, you know, that is an <laughs> expectation more and more uh, for working with big data um, is that you have, uh, you know, that that's a, a critical element, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, and uh, yep. by choosing the right visualization, that gives your your members or your staff, you know, a handle, uh, the ability to very quickly grasp um, the meaning and the story that that is usually otherwise more difficult to to see if you're just looking at the raw data. Yeah, I, I mean, I know in data science, the visualization is often viewed as key for the decision makers. So um, the, your statisticians, your um, technical people, data scientists are comfortable looking at, uh, uh, generally are comfortable looking at big tables full of numbers, spreadsheet views. But the decision makers need a visual dashboard that can show them uh, where they can quickly understand the trends over time, see the story that you're trying to tell. Um, so yeah, I, I love that, I agree. Of the, it would make a lot of sense to add visualization to those those five fees. All right, so it it looks like we've got um, a lot of responses coming in. So we're uh, most people have voted at this point. And um, Don, you might not be able to see this. So here's what we're we're seeing: 80% of people say they're using native and custom reports in their AMS. 84% say they're using Excel. So even more than the uh, AMS reporting. 16% are using Tableau, which we'll talk about. It's one of the business intelligence tools out there. 12% are using Power BI. That's another business intelligence tool. And then we've got 4% uh, saying other, um, 
and those are custom only custom reports in the AMS or just not using anything for data visualization. That's fascinating. Yep. Power BI is... So we'll be talking. Yeah, we'll be talking about a couple examples. Or your first example is really a group that started out with just Excel and AMS reports and then moved to using um, one of the business intelligence tools. Yep, that's exactly right. All right. And sorry I interrupted you, Don, but we're about to... Uh, Don, I'm going to hand over um, the keyboard and mouse to you at this point, and you can start uh, talking about... Um, the four A's success story. So. Okay, sure. While we're um, handing that over, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, and um, we'll start with a little bit of the backstory. Um, but before we do that, I just uh, want to provide just a summary of the, of the project. Um, and I have to say it was, it, it was probably one of the most uh, enjoyable projects of my career. Uh, 20 years of working uh, with associations to build solutions. Um, and uh, and I'll you know, try to unpack uh, a little of why that is as we go through and, and take a look at this. But uh, what we created was a, a member value report um, for the four A's. And uh, as we go through this, we'll talk about lessons learned and, and show you kind of uh, what we created and, and how that uh, came to be. Um, but the backstory. So um, let's see, Andy, if I, I'm still seeing the poll. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry. So we, oh, we will no close worries. the poll right now. Adessa just pointed that out to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, while we're transitioning there, uh, the four A's uh, reached out to a consulting company. They, they uh, worked with Delcor. There's a number of companies, um, that, similar companies. And uh, the engagement initially was uh, to sit down and to review their AMS. Um, they're, they were unhappy with their AMS, like I'm sure many of you all are. Um, and, uh, and it didn't take Delcor long to realize when they sat down with the 4As that the issue was not the AMS. Um, the organization had uh, come to a place which we're seeing more and more, um, and it was, it was like the Wild West in terms of digital strategy. Uh, every department was thinking about digital strategy and making decisions in isolation from the other departments. And there wasn't a person uh, at the organization um, that had as their responsibility really taking ownership of digital strategy for, for the entire organization. There were, there were people that were interested in that, but they had so many other things on their plate. And you know how this is, you're, you're resource constrained. Um, and so the organization just did not have somebody that um, that had that responsibility. So they, the recommendation from Delcor was, you need to hire a digital strategist. Have somebody come in whose responsibility it is to take ownership over uh, these different areas uh, throughout the organization. And so you're seeing a picture here of Miles Carey, VP of Digital Products, uh, and he's the person that we worked very closely with in this project on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, let's see. Just a little bit about the 4As, um, so you understand what type of association they are. They're a trade association. They have between six and 700 member agencies. And as a trade association, they have a very complex uh, membership model where some uh, of the holding companies may have 200 plus uh, subsidiaries and branch offices. So they represent uh, 1,300 plus offices around the United States. and they handle 85% of the media spend in the United States. They've been around 100 years, and they provide tremendous amount of value to their uh, members, both in terms of advocating for the industry uh, and in terms of all of the products and services that they offer. And so they've been working hard. Uh, they have uh, reps that go out and meet with the decision makers at their member agencies just to review uh, the value of membership with them. And, and so there was a process that they would follow uh, each year. We'll come back to that in a second. This graph, this is a waterfall chart that just shows what may um, be common for a number of your organizations. This is uh, showing the dues revenue over time. This is a nine-year period of time, and you can see that we're not where we would want to be. And the story here, there's a lot that goes behind, that, that goes into this story, the competition that the association is facing. And so there's just a lot that's really driving the need, and there has been for 
a number of years, the need to uh, more effectively communicate the value of membership to the members. So that's kind of the backdrop um, for creating this report. What we're seeing on the right here, this is a screenshot of the approach that the 4As used until we created the member value report. So this was a, was a very long Excel spreadsheet with a ton of formulas and there, it was an arduous process where data was pulled in manually. Um, they would have, for some of their more complicated agencies, two full-time staff members working for an entire month to create a report that, that a, a rep would use to go out into the field and meet with an agency. And so they just did not have the time to even prepare reports for all of the agencies. Um, and so this was, uh, th this has been an issue then for a number of years for the 4As and, and was the, the backdrop and uh, what led to the, the uh, development of the member value report. This uh, just really quick picks up um, something I wanted to mention, uh, and that is that um, the there is, um, and this gets to sort of the descriptive model, there are features that are available in many AMSs that you can use um, to track the engagement that your members have. Um, for the four A's, they, they actually looked at a number of things. So uh, they're aware of the fact that there's engagement scoring. Uh, there are products that are out on the market that are designed uh, to provide an analytics solution but what they needed to have developed was was custom, and we'll see that as we as we get into that. So th these these are features that have their use. Uh, these engagement scores can be very helpful for staff to be able to have a single number, which gives them just a, a descriptive way to kind of look at uh, a point in time and see where an agency is, for example, with the four A's in terms of their peers. Um, but there are other other aspects of engagement that aren't communicated. What we're seeing here is, uh, go ahead. Andy. Can I ask a quick question, Don? What yeah. are those engagement scores? Take the net form example. Do you know what it's based on to build that engagement score? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's based on the activities. And so you will, um, you will actually define in the AMS the specific activities that, uh, that you want to track. And then you'll assign scores uh, to those. So you, you'll uh, assign value for different types of activities. For example, um, a specific value for committee participation and for attending an event or okay. um, completing a, um, a learning management system course. And then they uh, normalize those scores. So it's a normalized. And then so you can actually have multiple, like uh, in the NetForm case, you can create multiple uh, A scores. Uh, for different departments, for example. So the learning... So the, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. So the, the oh. issue for 4 is is basically that the AMS doesn't have all the data they want to incorporate into um, an engagement score, for example. Or I guess it's more that they want to show ROI, not engagement. That would be another reason why they needed to move beyond what they had available in the AMS. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, and so okay. they needed yeah. to, and and the way they tracked their engagement um, was was a little bit more complex than what they could use. So the engagement mm -hmm. score is great. It's staff facing, um, it, and mm -hmm. uh, and so it can provide a single number, which is useful in conjunction with uh, other things. And so um, and that that's I guess the takeaway is it's not an you know either or, um, it, right. you know it's the both yep. and kind of a thing. So. The 4A's engagement um, objectives, so that this was something that they had uh, going into the development of the report. Um, they knew that organizationally uh, engagement was would fall into one of these um, four objectives, business support, networking and knowledge sharing, talent development, and agency visibility. And so we're going to kind of drill in and, and for the report, we'll take a look specifically at, at the talent development uh, part of that. But this just provides at least some of the framework. And so for each one of these engagement objectives, then they had multiple categories within those objectives. And we'll see some of those here in just a second. So when we started the project, the, the idea initially was we'll create this single report, we'll send an email out, and or we'll just send an email and, and attach a PDF. The report would be in a PDF form. Give the, um, the uh, recipients a, a code or a PIN that they would enter. Um, but the idea was initially that it's going to be a single report. Uh, this is what we kind of ended up with. <laughs> and so uh, as is, um, you know, 
commonly the case when uh, you when you dig into a project, you realize that there's a certain uh, amount of complexity uh, to the problem. So what you're seeing here, broadly, two things. There, there's six reports total. On the right, um, there was a, a website. This is like an annual report. So it's there. It's they call it the year in review, and this is available to the public. It's a responsive uh, website that's got. Um, visualizations and metrics and just to, uh, it tells the story uh, of the forays um, and all of the value that they're providing for the industry over the this past year on the left what you see are the reports that are developed for the members and, and in some cases for the staff so we see there's some reports um, like on the left you can see this report that's got branching there's three different branches there depending on uh, the level of engagement of the agency there's a prospecting report that the 4A staff will use, and they have uh, the ability before they're sitting down with a prospect to kind of do a what-if scenario with them to show, like, based on your revenue, um, agencies like you, uh, and, and these uh, types of participation, this is the kind of ROI you could expect to receive. So, these are so this, was, this was your design process, and you basically ended up um, creating different variations on a member value report for different audiences is That's what it exactly like. right. Yeah, so okay. this initial concept yeah. of a member value report um, grew into six different uh, okay. reports, essentially. Okay. Yep. And so, and I'll just take just a minute here to uh, to shout out to the, this was a very collaborative process. There were a number of, um, of uh, companies involved. There was a design company out of Colorado, Greenstone. And so what we're seeing is some of the deliverables from the process uh, that they followed um, to create the, the design for these reports, and um, and and also just really quick the the I think one of the success factors of this project was uh, the close collaboration of both the design team and the implementation team because a lot of times in projects. Uh, web projects, um, any type of a project where there's a design element. You have designers typically will work in isolation and then they hand off their deliverables to the implementers. This project was not like that. We were working collaboratively through the whole process. Um, and the outcome and the, and the process um, was just so much better uh, for having done it that way. Now I'm just going to sort of drill in here. Um, and so we're going to look at again a specific report and talk a little bit about the visualizations um, and the process that that we went through so as we worked with the association um, and as the team were began to think about you know how do we tell this story and what kind of visualizations do we use initially we were excited about you know some of the more modern visualizations radar charts and stacked graphs and and things like that um, but the decision was made, and um, after seeing the end product, it, it feels like it was the right decision to really scale that back and simplify. And so, for example, here what we're seeing, we're not even seeing really any charts or anything. We're just seeing checkboxes that show uh, the participation. And so this accomplishes two things. It helps them see what they've done. And so if they've participated, for example, in any on-demand learning, then it's going to show that as a checkbox. But they can also see all the other things that they haven't taken advantage of. And so for each one of the engagement and objectives. And the audience for this success. report, Don? I'm sorry, the audience, who, who did they show this to? Who was who this for? Um, so there are the, and this gets back to the five reports. So there is a version of this report that goes out to the CEOs and the decision makers, and it okay. will have financial data in it. Then there's a version of the report that go to the staff. Uh, and so this is the kind of data that the staff would be able to see because there's really nothing financial okay. here. Um, gotcha. It just shows yeah. yeah some of the capabilities. This is a that's a good segue into um, this screen here. This is a screen that only the CEOs and CFOs at the organizations would see. So this is designed for the decision makers, and this is the ROI screen. So this is where we're demonstrating the return on investment, and it can see that. And again, you can see um, the simplicity of the visualization. Uh, and so we're able to just show a, a bar chart, a very simple bar chart, um, add some fun animations to it, and, um, and then add enough data here so that for those that are interested in kind of getting a sense for um, what the costs were, where they were coming from, what the actual value is, they can see that. And then as they progress through the report, they, they'll be able to see the more detailed uh, information. 
This next screen is, uh, this is also for one of the engagement objectives. Um, you can see here the visualization actually, it's just an emoji. Um, and so there's several things that were going on here. One is just the, the numbers, um, just showing it kind of like in card fashion uh, um, for your agency and for all your subsidiaries. If you're um, a holding company, these are the total on-demand courses. Um, and then this section is really powerful here. This is driven by cohorts and cohorts were defined uh, based on revenue. Um, these are the kind of nuances to get back to your question, Andy, about um, using something like the A score, um, you know, having this kind of capability um, you don't have with sort of a single number. Um, but by putting a data warehouse in place, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, you have the ability to show this. And this is an example here on the right of, of prescriptive uh, analytics. So based on the information that we have about this agency and comparing them with their cohorts, we can give them very specific recommendations. This next screen just shows uh, a visualization. This is actually just something that was shared with the staff um, and it was interesting to get their feedback because they, um, they know their uh, members and they had some ideas of what engagement would look like. And so what we're seeing here, these are the cohorts and they're just like from cohorts basically going from small agencies uh, to very large agencies. And you can see then the difference uh, for the four main engagement objectives by cohort. And so there were some things that when the staff saw this, they, uh, you know, they were nodding their heads thinking, yeah, that's what I expected. And other things when they, when they saw this uh, kind mm -hmm. of representation that um, were surprising to them. And that was something you, um, that staff can pull themselves now? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And that's an outcome okay. of, the, of the project. Um, and because there's a data warehouse uh, now working behind the scenes to support the report, then you can connect pretty much any visualization tool. Um, and you, know, you can use Power BI, you can use Excel um, mm -hmm. if you okay. want to. The 4 ace plan of attack, um, one of the things, crawl, walk, run, I just want to mention because I think that um, when we think about this, um, when we think about any project, it's easy to get um, caught up in, in trying, to, um, trying to do too much at the beginning. And I, so I think it's important to start the process. So for the 4 A's, that process was starting initially with Excel um, and then taking the next step to building the member value report. Um, another uh, so this is sort of a lens that I that uh, was useful uh, on this project and, and any of the projects I've worked on, and that's people, process, and technology in that order. And so the four A's had made some technology decisions before we um, got started, and we had to abandon some of those technology decisions and focus really on people and processes. And then once we had those in place, then we could make more intelligent technology decisions to determine hmm. what actual technologies are we going to use to to build this. Um, there was, a, of course, we're pulling data from a number of different data sources, and so there was a process of sitting down uh, with actually just using an Excel spreadsheet to collect uh, information on where is all, where is engagement happening, and what are all these data sources? We'll see that just in a second. Very close collaboration. There was a data warehouse that was developed, and that's a good segue uh, into this next section. So, in order to support the the report. We needed to have a way to pull the data together. And so there's different technologies you can use. Uh, in the 4 ace case, they already had paid the licensing for uh, a Microsoft database. And so they were able to leverage that essentially for free. And so we built a data warehouse, uh, which uh, allows you to define what are called cubes. You can think of them as sort of pre-processed mini databases that allow you to very quickly uh, ask questions of your data. And so you might create them for things like events and marketing engagement and community engagement and, and uh, learning. So the data warehouse is basically just a place to collect data from many different sources. Uh, essentially, you're getting the, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I stole your thunder, go ahead. <laughs> That's a good segue, that's exactly yeah. right. So there's a, for the data warehouse, there's a staging database where we're pulling data all in together, and then there's a process where you'll you'll process all that data into these cubes that, um, again, that's just pre-processed information. But what we're showing here is just all of the 
all the different sources of data that were identified uh, for this particular project and, and that it's all flowing into this engagement infrastructure. Um, and in fact, that's, that, that, that's the way the data warehouse is set up. So there are a variety of cubes, um, but there's a main engagement cube that's used that's driving the uh, member value report. So a variety of different data sources um, that are working together. This is just a quick um, diagram that shows the, the way that the learning management uh, system cube is set up. And so some details there. Uh, and by configuring a cube um, in the data warehouse for learning management, that allows the staff to, uh, to connect their data visualization tools and to, and to slice and dice the data to look and see you know, how many um, students started or are in progress for a particular agency and all of its subsidiaries. They can very uh, quickly answer those kinds of questions. Um, so, so yeah, having that users map to agencies would be key for a trade association. So you can say, this is how many, if you're looking at learning management system data, this is how many course completions you've had at your agency. Um, you can take the individual user data and, and aggregate it. So that, that makes sense. That's not good. That's exactly right. All right. It's always interesting, um, you know, to know who, like, which department owned the project. Um, and so, in this case, uh, the project was owned by uh, membership. So Molly Rosen, um, her title is executive vice president of agency relations and membership. So, and, and membership was really the the uh, department that uh, that had ownership of this. But this was again a very collaborative process. So, uh, Chick Foxgrover, executive vice president of creative technologies and innovation. Uh, Miles reports to Chick, and Chick um, was instrumental in, uh, in in helping to shape the direction of the project. Um, and then we had, uh, of course, marketing and communications was, um, if there was sort of a, a second owner, it would be marketing and communications. Um, and then there was very active involvement uh, on the part of the president and CEO in, in the process. So we're using collaborative tools, and, and she was working, uh, you know, with the team, all hours of, you know, the days and nights, um, helping to change copy and provide feedback. And um, so it was a very collaborative process. But at the end of the day, it, it was um, it was owned by membership. In terms of next steps for the foyers, they uh, they're interested now. They've got this, you know, member value report. They want to. Um, make this more accessible to members. Right now, it's, a, it's an actual PDF that they allow the members to access. Um, at some point in the future, they want that to be accessible uh, through their profile when they log into the website. Um, and, and they're also, since they have this, this uh, data warehouse, they're interested in, in leveraging the predictive and prescriptive capabilities. So really um, taking a look at where there's correlation and what that means in terms of uh, encouraging more uh, engagement. And then of course the staff is really excited right now about the fact that they will have visibility into all of these data sources. So now that the data warehouse is set up and they have cubes that um, allow them to connect and view data uh, and slice and dice that data for all of these different areas, uh, within the organization and, and for the engagement um, at the organization as a whole, they'll, they'll be able to use, the, and they're going to be using specifically Power BI, they'll be able to use that tool then just to connect and to um, ask questions of the data and again and slice and dice the data. So in summary, this was a fascinating project. Hopefully as we've gone through this, this um, has been encouraging to you in the sense that um, you know, you, you can start small and build on what you know, and um, and then hopefully you'll be able to identify some of the ways that you can take your organization, uh, you know, to build something that conveys the value of your membership to your members. Great. Thanks, Don. That is a really great story. Um, and uh, I, I think you're, you made the point well about going people, processes, technology. I think that's, that's it seems to be really key. I've, I've seen um, other associations that have had success with data projects like this. There's been a commitment to having somebody who owns the data project um, because nobody else is going to get it done in their spare time when they're already running, you know, one of the other departments in the in the group. Um, I thought the executive commitment piece was also really important. So that's uh, something we always hear um, in data science that uh, 
you need executive sponsorship, executive commitment to get a project like this done. So on that note, I'm going to talk quickly about the American College of Chest Physicians, uh, or CHEST, which uh, is, uh, you know, full disclosure, one of WebCourseWorks clients, a group that we've worked with for, for a long time now. Uh, so CHEST is, um, you know, a medical specialty society, but their members are not exclusively uh, physicians. Their members are also other types of clinicians or anybody else who cares about uh, about chest medicine, um, particularly lung health. And CHEST has made the commitment to have a data team. So if you think of it in terms of people process technology, they have a team of uh, data specialists who are pulling together a data warehouse um, and building visualizations in, uh, in, a, in a business intelligence tool. This is an example from, from CHEST's annual report. So you, this is on their website. You can find this if you Google it. Um, so this is uh, something they built from their data warehouse using uh, their business intelligence tool. This is a data visualization showing information about their members, stuff like what their certification is, where they're coming from, obviously, um, what profession they're from. And if you uh, move on in this annual report, you can find, find a lot of information about their learning. So they're pulling in data that's from their learning management system, their association management system, they're blending it together so they can get this kind of information, like how many registrations they had, what their attendance is, that kind of thing. Um, types of learning is what you see in this visual visualization over here. And then chess kind of, I would say their brand is advanced clinical training, at least from an education perspective. That's what's really important for them. And they run a series of live courses uh, that um, they maintain over the course of years, and they've done some really nice projects to be able to track the outcomes of those courses. Uh, and yep, here it is. So uh, CHEST, um, for each of their live courses, their advanced clinical training courses, they track a bunch of data, a lot of it coming from the learning management system, like scores on post-tests. They also do, uh, they do hands-on clinical training. So they have live faculty who are assessing the learners in clinical procedures. Um, in a simulated uh, format. So um, they're pulling in data from those assessments, which is also tracked in the LMS ratings. So that would be coming from um, learner evaluations. Uh, and also they pull in some attendance information, which is tracked in their AMS. They do um, psychometric analysis uh, using the LMS tools, and then they pull that all together. Uh, in this case, um, this is going back to 2017 in Excel. And then uh, they now are able to offer these visualizations. The key point of the visualization is that it, it tracks a given course over time. So if you've, you've got their course, Advanced Critical Care Echocardiography, they can track it over a period of years and see, okay, our, um, our confidence rating, our learner's re idea of their own confidence has changed this way. Knowledge assessment scores are trending this way. Uh, net promoter scores, like would you recommend this to a peer or trending this way? So this is a key dashboard for their um, executives to keep tabs on how a given course is doing in terms of its quality over time. Then uh, another really cool project that Chest has done and a great example of how they're thinking strategically about data, um, they do high fidelity simulation. So these are um, robots or mannequins that have uh, vital signs and can simulate uh, medical events, which you can use to do simulated medical procedures. Um, so this device here is the mannequin, um, and they use it for doing things like uh, difficult airways. So how do you intervene if somebody's having trouble breathing in an emergency room? What's the difficult airway intervention? Uh, and the, uh, the mannequin is giving off vital signs. You can track all that. All of that gets reported um, to a computer, the mannequin is saying, like, I detected this intervention, this is what happened in my vital signs. That's all going to the computer that's being used to run uh, the, uh, the simulation. And what Chess did was invested to get that um, data flowing into their learning management system so that they could actually build it into the context of a larger course that was happening on the learning management system. Um, and then they could report on it. 
and they could eventually pull that data into their data data warehouse. So it's a really a great example of big a big data approach. The mannequin is kind of like an Internet of Things device. You know, it's a high tech device that's connected to the Internet, and then they're pulling all that data data in and analyzing it um, in in their uh, data analysis tools. They also have faculty who are manually evaluating um, the the learner during this, and that also gets done in the learning management system. So they're pull, able to pull in a large amount of data about these simulations. So then uh, pulling way back to the, um, the, the widest possible view, CHEST's analytics platform is pulling in information from their AMS net forum. The LMS data flows through net forum. Um, and it gets to the analytics platform, uh, which is where their data team is working, building these visualizations. You can see they're also able to, these days you can pull in data from a lot of public sources, like the US Census, for example, um, or things that are specific to your profession, like the um, Centers for Disease Control, uh, or the their certification board, which is um, the American Board of uh, internal medicine or ABMS, which is the board of boards, et cetera. So they're, they're able to pull in all this data and blend it. Uh, and then they're taking a very product focused uh, approach where um, they're use, they've got their, pro, their data team working on building data visualization products. So for example, for their annual meeting, for vendors who are exhibiting at their booth, they've got a booth IQ product, which gives them gives the vendors uh, great information about about the um, their exhibit and the, the exhibit hall, um, and you know increases the value of of exhibiting with Chest. Or for their for physicians um, at Chest, uh, information that's really specific to their particular peer group. Um, to the the physicians who, who they work with closely, and uh, it helps them keep up on what's going on in their specialty. Another example of a data visualization product that Chest offers is deep dives into researchers and and data scientists in the field. So you know, Chest of course is the, the top researchers in their specialty belong to Chest, and um, Chest is able to get data from them. Uh, and build these uh, these visualization products around research. Then the data lab. So this is a, uh, a high value product that is is giving you ways of exploring um, all of the data that Chest that Chest has in one place. So I think Chest has taken to heart the the idea that data visualization can be a way to create a product um, that has value. All right. So Odessa gave me the um, the warning that we've got uh, about 12 minutes left now. Um, so we're gonna talk real quickly about an approach to getting this done um, based on uh, Don's, uh, Don's experience. Um, but we wanted to ask real quickly, so Don, do you wanna talk about your data maturity model, sort of thinking about where uh, an organization is at as far as their data uh, maturity? Yeah, absolutely. So you'd think of it as a continuum uh, with on the left, you have uh, an organization that uh, is probably using, you know, the reporting functionality that they have in their AMS, but the that reporting is not necessarily used uh, for decision making purposes. It's kind of like uh, you share at meetings and after the fact, um, occasionally it might be used for making uh, decisions. Data proficient would be sort of the next level uh, where you have uh, the organization is um, has some KPIs that they've defined um, and and they're starting the process of of using data in the decision making process. Data savvy is like critical decisions in the organization are made with data in mind. So before they make a critical decision, the organization's culture is asking for data and looking for data to help drive those decisions. And data-driven is sort of this level of uh, like self-actualization in terms of data. And this would be where all decisions in the organization are driven by data. And so the expectation is that a decision isn't made unless there is some data to help drive that. Okay, so we've got some results coming in where people are mostly uh, putting themselves in the first two levels. Data aware is about two-thirds of people so far. Data proficient is about 20%. 
we've got 13% saying does not apply at my organization. And I just, like in looking at this model, Donna reminds me a lot, um, I don't know if you know Jeff Cobb and Salisa Steele who are um, consultants and uh, their consultancy is called Tagoras. They have a learning business maturity model that also puts a lot of emphasis on how you make use of data um, over it w across your entire learning business. And the top level is, you know, we are data driven as a learning business. So there's just a lot of emphasis out there right now on using data to make decisions and having organizational an organizational emphasis on um, gathering that data, data and then using it. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. It looks like 60% in the first category, 30% in the second category. Nobody says they're data savvy or data driven yet at their organization. So you're certainly not not alone in that. If you feel that way, I think it's you know it's a journey to get to that point. Um, let's let's talk about how you can get going. So uh, a one two three process to kind of it can be sort of overwhelming. So let's just think about what you what you really need to do to have a data project um, that succeeds. There are really three things. You got to find your data, blend it, and analyze it. So examples of where you might find your data, AMSs, LMSs, e-commerce or accounting, community platforms. Um, Don, where else have you seen associations get their data from in this kind of project? Sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> you're, you know, thinking about any um, type of engagement. So it might be if you have a benefits program, your e-marketing platform, the unsubscribes, the bounce backs that you're getting. Um, you know, the Foyers had a custom research database, and there were requests that are made um, to to use that database. And so all that information, like that information, was tracked in an Excel spreadsheet. There's probably a variety of things like that in every association, these little Excel spreadsheets of, you know, different um, interactions that you're having with members. And, and those really convey uh, some aspect of value. Um, and so those all need to be considered when pulling it together. Google Analytics data is another big one. Um, uh, advocacy certification, I mean, there's just a uh, just a long list. Any any way for your particular association, if it's a professional society, it's going to be maybe a little different than a trade association. But all those data points that can translate to engagement. Great. Okay. And then um, blending your data. So blending is the idea of to really be useful, you need to be able to line up um, data from different platforms together. That's the whole advantage of having a data warehouse. So I might be able to say, um, you know, my AMS is tracking these, uh, say, member engagement that the learning management system knows nothing nothing about. But it'd be really interesting to say, um, see if members who happen to, uh, you know, subscribe to a certain newsletter um, also, uh, you know, did really well in a certain type of course, for example. That'd be an example of blending data. Um, so how can you do that? Well, you got you have to get the data into your data warehouse. So you might be able to get direct database access. Um, so maybe you actually can, you know, pull queries from the database of some of your platforms. There's also APIs. So APIs are the ways that um, two software platforms can talk to each other. So your AMS might be able to go to your learning management system and say, um, I need a, a report of uh, completions of courses in the last 24 hours. That would happen through through an API. Uh, data feeds, that's the um, traditional approach of a, a report gets spit out by one platform and sent to a place where another platform can pick it up. So um, every night your LMS sends out a report that goes to an FTP site and then um, your AMS through an automated process picks that up. And then there's sneakerware, which is uh, the, uh, the industry term for having people do the work that your software should be doing. Um, so it's, uh, you know, uh, like they're using their, their um, using uh, their sneakers, they're going from the LMS to the AMS, they're downloading um, a report from the LMS and loading it into the AMS. So those are all examples of, of blending data together. Um, Don, have you, did you see, just taking the 4As example, were they using any of these approaches for blending data? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, even um, a little bit of sneaker wear, probably. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the, the preferences APIs. Um, I guess one other thing I would just add to blending your data that we saw was just a need. You may have mentioned this, uh, the audio cut out for just a second, um, was the uh, need to uh, be cleaning data. And so we uh, we will talk about that and sort of lessons learned in a second. But um, that was a, definitely a part of this process. Um, yeah. But, Tremendous amount of value to getting that data in one location um, from a performance perspective, a security perspective, and data governance perspective, and so on. There's a lot of advantages to having something like a data warehouse to achieve that. All right. Okay, then analyzing your data. So this is really the the um, cherry on the top of the project. It, uh, once you actually have blended your data, you've gotten to the point you've done most of the work and then the analysis is the fun part for for the people who, who use these platforms. So um, you can use association specific vendors. Uh, there, there are also data visualization plat packages that are out there. So Tableau is what Chest used, Power BI is what the forays used. Um, similar platforms are Click and Domo. They're all strong products. Uh, and we got five minutes left, so I'm gonna uh, move through this quickly. Then building your own visualizations. Um, data scientists prefer tools like R and Python. Uh, MySQL and MongoDB are types of databases, uh, data-driven documents. John, do you know what that is? I don't know what data-driven documents. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a, actually uh, that's a great question. Uh, this is D3. It's a JavaScript library for visualization. Oh, D3. Okay, yeah. Yeah, oh, they okay. have. They have some fantastic yeah, examples. So uh, if you Google D3, right. this is a great way to get inspiration on a data visualization from a data visualization perspective. A lot of uh, visualizations that are submitted by the community. Right. So these would be tools that people who have coding abilities or database management skills would would use. Um, and it's I know, Don, that's what you you've been working a lot with on the Forays project as well. So um, let's get to lessons learned and then get take some questions. So. Um, Don, you want to talk quickly about the lessons learned from the 4As project? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've kind of already talked about some of these here. So I think the one that um, I would uh, emphasize is start small. Um, so you've heard of minimum viable product. Um, mm -hmm. Really, it's the most efficient way uh, to get started on any project. And so you want to dive in. And you know, what does that look like? Um, for your organization, that may look like just pulling some data from a couple of data sources together and then trying to use some of the features in Excel, uh, maybe the Power Pivot feature and, and some charting. Um, and so once you start that process, it's going to lead to the next step and then to the next step. Um, I think also taking advantage of you know all the different learning um, options that you have available to you um, and really coming up to speed on um, on visualization and, and how you can use these tools in your organization is helpful but um, starting small I think is probably one of the main things um, I think that I mentioned data cleansing we underestimated that I think it's I think everybody <laughs> underestimates that <laughs> and so uh, yeah. it's important to mention not just in terms of the amount of time that the vendor has to spend but there's a lot of staff time too so the 4A staff uh, were um, surprised by the amount of time that they had to spend going back through and really working um, closely with the team to make sure that the data was was cleaned um, and the last point about taxonomy is just that um, it's it's very helpful um, when uh, you know starting a project like we did with the forays and any type of uh, data project to have it an organizational taxonomy in place and by that I mean just a, a way for you to consistently have a classification you can call it categories um, that uh, you're using across all of the different systems so that your categories and your LMS aren't different than the categories in your event management system and so on so those would be some of the takeaways all right Don, you have time to stick around for a few questions if people still still want to ask them. I don't mind going a little bit over. Um, so, uh, if you, if you've been if you've got burning questions, feel free to type them into the questions panel, um, and we'd be be happy to field them. While we're waiting, I'll I'll say yeah that data cleaning that you mentioned, Don. That is. Uh, you know, studies say that data scientists spend something like 90% of their time cleaning the data and only 10% of their time on the the cool stuff, the analysis, building models, and that that kind of thing. So that absolutely is 
you should factor in um, a significant amount of time for that in your project. Yeah, one of the things that um, was helpful as we took a look at the data sources that were available was just identifying, making sure we understood how to link that data back to, uh, for us, the, the core part of the, of the system is the AMS, and so how to link that data back to some type of identifier that we can use to make sure that we have uh, everything linked together. Awesome. So Don, we do, we do have a question. So uh, I think this is for you. Um, what methodology was used to calculate the value score? So I think this is talking about the, um, you know, the ROI uh, bottom line for four A's. Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so what we did was uh, for each of the types of engagements, this, this would be kind of similar to the way uh, a score or some type of an engagement score is calculated. Um, so you've got the activities and then you have to um, assign a value. And so the, the value assignment is independent of the activity. So let's take an activity that an activity may be um, calling the four A's up and, and uh, asking uh, for information from the research department. And so the four A's then would uh, determine what the value is for that particular activity. And, and, th and those values are uh, monetary values. Um, in some cases, it's a little different because, for example, like if we're dealing with uh, an event registration, then the value is the delta between what members pay and what non-members pay. Um, and so it's, it's one of those two forms of, 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 value, of uh, value calculation. But there are, um, there are values that then are associated with each activity. So at the end of the day, uh, the the final value score is just the sum total of all of those values that are assigned to all the activities that you would have related to a particular agency. Cool. All right, we got a couple more questions. So um, thanks, Shreya, for that question. And then Leslie asks, for those of us newer to data, data analytics, can you talk about what you mean when you say data cleansing? Um, I, I mean, I'll start. So that data cleansing or data cleaning means getting your data into a shape shape where you can analyze it. So like a simple example would be um, like you have a, a date that's tracked as a, um, as, as a text field, for example, and your computer needs that to be you know, as an integer. So it can, it can do analy it can analyze, it can write a formula that says like, it's been this much time from this, uh, from this date to that date. So d data cleaning is, is not a super fun topic, <laughs> except for you know extreme data analytics geeks. Uh, but it's it's definitely a, a lot of the work that goes into a project like this. Yeah, so I don't know the, if you have anything to add about. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, for the four A's, um, you know, one of the things that uh, um, was really time consuming in terms of data cleansing was just uh, going back through and making sure that, <clears throat> for example, individuals were associated with the right. Um, organization, uh, you know, because we're going to be sending out these messages to the CEOs and CFOs, so the staff had to go through it and and make sure that that list was very carefully curated and up to date. Uh, and then in our in the Fourier's case, in their AMS, there are different ways that relationships between organizations are are managed. And so in some cases, there uh, were there was broken uh, relationships between, say, a uh, holding company and subsidiaries. And so we were able to run queries to identify that, you know, with uh, one of the fields that we use to track that information, we can see that there should be a relationship there, but then in other areas where uh, typically there would be data related to that relationship that's missing. Uh, so, you know, there was just time that was required for the staff then to go back through and, uh, you know, some of that you can, you can address in an automated fashion, some of that um, unfortunately requires staff to go back through and, and check and make sure, yep, this is uh, supposed to be a subsidiary of this particular agency, and that changed a couple years ago, and it just wasn't updated in the database. All right, and sort of on along the same lines, Tony asks, with the four A's, were the activities automated, or did staff have to manually enter the information in the database? That's a fantastic question. So some of it is automated. So much of the data that's coming, for example, out of the LMS and from systems where you have transactional data that is just being recorded, that's all automated. Uh, but there is some data, for example, uh, when a member agency 
uh, writes an article that's published on their website, uh, that particular activity needs to be recorded. And so uh, we're looking at ways to help um, to help automate that. But right now they have this is where they have essentially, you know, Excel spreadsheets and Google Sheets and different ways that the staff are tracking that information. So we're currently working with the 4As to automate as much of that as possible, but there's currently uh, processes that uh, require that that data um, be manually synced. So it's a great question. Yeah, was, okay, so um, we're gonna wrap up here today, but uh, here's our contact information. You'll also get an email after the webinar um, with a link to the recording. Uh, and I think, do, do we do evaluations? We do evaluations in some way. So yeah, you'll get a survey um, as well. Um, but Don, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, thanks Andy. Yep, um, and thanks everybody who was, was on the call. Thanks for your great questions and, and your interest. And uh, we'll hope to uh, keep in touch in the future. Bye. Thanks, everyone.